All right, so you're going to follow me around on the service call today. Uh, it is a cold morning here in coastal North Carolina. It's like high 20s, early 30s. It's not supposed to be this cold. I moved to the beach for the reason. Um, but I am uh, all bundled up here, and we're going to go take a look at a heat pump. The customer said their Ecobee thermostat was alerting them that it was using a lot of strip heat. Now, they're in Illinois, and this is in North Carolina. So the house is not occupied. Their neighbor is going to let me in. Uh, and I'm just going to go through my normal diagnostic process. It's a full system diagnostic. So I've gone towards that approach rather than just to jump in there and try to figure out what's wrong specifically with the unit in that moment. I'd rather zoom out and take a look at the entire system. I'm going to measure airflow. I'm going to photo document everything. I'm going to check things that maybe aren't related to the fault at hand. But that way, when I present some options and recommendations, it's a holistic list. And there's less of a chance of me getting a call back because I missed something. So follow along and I'll show you what I do. All right, so one of the first things that I do is a walk around the equipment with my hands in my pockets, just trying to get the lay of the land, especially when I've only been here for the first time. So just some basic things, just going to make sure none of the circuit breakers are tripped and make sure that the panel looks okay. We'll make sure that the thermostat is calling for heat. And it looks like the condensing unit is not running. But instead of diving straight into that, we're going to start with our process from the top. This app is iAuditor from Safety Culture. I customized it for my own process. I'm going to start with putting some customer information down there or what some of the concerns are. The next thing I'm going to do is deploy my indoor air quality sensor. That's just my handheld device from Atmo Tube. If I were here for a maintenance on this unit, I would be filling these out, these maintenance items. But this is a service call, so that's going to get in a next thing I'm going to do is continue with my walkthrough. We're going to put down what kind of system this is. This is an air-to-air -air split heat pump. And then we're going to document what kind of thermostat they have. They do have an energy-saving thermostat. It is an Ecobee Wi-Fi thermostat. We're going to get some photo documentation of it. And that way we know that we don't need to have a conversation about them in the future about getting a better thermostat. They already have a good one. We're going to also document whether they have a carbon monoxide detector. We're going to take a picture of it. And then we're going to move on to the filters because we need to make sure that they have not only clean filters, but we need to know whether we need to make any recommendations about any better filtration down the road. Next, we get to the ductwork, and I think ductwork should be looked at before the equipment. We've got some really long flex runs here. That's probably going to lead to an airflow problem, so we're going to document that. There's some poor craftsmanship here. We're going to document all that, take some pictures. That way, we can have a conversation about that with a customer later. And we're going to put a fail on the duct workmanship because, obviously, this is not how you're supposed to do it. And then we're going to keep going with looking at our ductwork ceiling and insulation. Looks like we've got some unsealed ducts there. Does that have anything to do with our outdoor unit not coming on? No, but we need to document it. We're going to take a picture of the inside of the ducts to notate how clean or how dirty they may be. Then we move on to the next item. Now we get to the indoor unit. And we're going to take a picture of our model number. We're going to put down the age, 10 to 15 years old, and the general condition of the unit. Everything gets photo documented here. And we're then going to zoom into the blower motor and the blower assembly. It's like that blower assembly is a little bit dirty, so we're going to make a note of that. That's going to get a fail, and that's going to get flagged at the end of the report, just like everything else that gets a red flag. Next, we're going to take a look at the indoor coil. We're going to grab some photos of that. That doesn't look too bad. So we're going to document the condition of our refrigerant piping, make sure that we don't have any signs of leaks, make sure that the insulation is intact there that was ran and installed properly. Next, we move on to condensate piping. Now here I'm looking to make sure that it's piped correctly, there's good pitch, uh, that it has a clean out as well as a vent, and it looks like that we're lacking some of those things there. And then I look for condensate overflow of safety. So we're going to make sure that we have enough float switches on there that's going to cut the unit off in case that pan overflows. Looks like that they're missing a float switch there at the air handler. Yes, there is one at the pan, but we can stop that water leak a lot sooner if we had one at the air handler. So we're going to make a note of that, and we're going to offer that as a recommendation at the end of the call. So we're going to move on to the service disconnect. I always check my disconnects because I've had a lot of service calls over the years with burnt wires and disconnects failing. We're going to photo document that. We photo document every element on this unit here so that we really cover ourselves. We move to the wiring on the indoor unit. We'll make sure that we have good solid connections, that nothing looks overheated, and nothing needs a little bit extra attention. Now we're going to move on to some of those components. There's no capacitor because this is an ECM motor, and we don't have any signs of refrigerant leaks. If this unit was gassy, there would be some additional items I would need to photo document because it's a heat pump. I don't have to. And before I go to check the outdoor unit, I go ahead and just deploy all my MeasureQuick probes that go on the inside, and then we're going to move to the outside. 
There's an outdoor unit section to this checklist, and it's very similar to the indoor unit. We're going to first get the model number. We're going to get some photo documentation. We're going to also record the unit age as well as its condition. It's the same age as the indoor unit. Then we're going to start looking at some of those components, refrigerant piping. Now, I did put a fail here, and that's because we've got some insulation issues. We've got a penetration that's not sealed. So we're going to make a note of that, and we're going to continue on with our checklist. Then it gets red flags, usually going to get an explanation in the notes, and then we're going to move on to the rest of our list. Really, I do a refrigerant acid test, but I ran out of those kits, so we're going to have to put NA there. Then we're going to move to the outdoor unit serviceability and workmanship. I'm looking for things like, is it level? Was it installed correctly? Is it in just in generally good condition? Is it easy to work on? We're going to grab those photos, and then we're going to put a pass on this one. Then we're going to zoom into the outdoor coil. Is it clean? Is it in good shape? Is it corroded? We're going to grab some more photo documentation there. In this case, the coil was clean, but there was a lot of debris in the bottom of the unit. Looks like this unit needs some maintenance, so we're going to make a note of that in the notes. And then we move on to other components, like the compressor and the accumulator. I want to see if there's a lot of rust because of all that debris in there. We're going to grab some pictures. Doesn't look like there's anything to be too concerned about there. Then we're going to move on to the outdoor fan. Obviously, we have an issue with the compressor and the outdoor fan motor not running, so we really don't know the true condition of them. If for some reason we need to go back and change that pass to a fail, we will. And then we move on to other components like the reversing valve. And then just like we did on the inside, we do need to check the disconnect on the outside as well. Grab some photo documentation of that. Disconnect and its wiring looked okay, so it gets a pass. And then we move on to the outdoor unit wiring. While I've got the fan pulled so I can look in the bottom of the unit and document the compressor, accumulator, and reverse valve, I'll go ahead and put my true suction temperature clamp on there. I'll go ahead and grab some pictures of the outdoor unit wiring. That looks like it's in pretty good shape. And we'll just zoom into some of the other components like the defrost board, the capacitor, the contactor. But we're also going to notate what the specific condition of like the contactor is. That's an original contactor. This unit is over five years old. It probably should be replaced. We're going to make a note of that. Even though the contactor has not failed yet, we want to make a note that that original contactor probably needs to be replaced as a predictive repair. We're not telling them that it has failed, we're just saying that it's probably at that age where it would be a good idea to replace it. Next thing we're going to look at is the capacitor. That capacitor's got some corrosion on it, so we're going to make a note of that. The capacitor was tested under load. It tested out okay, so we're going to make a note that it simply has some corrosion on it. We're a little concerned about that. That fluid could leak out and lead to early failure, so we recommend replacing it for that reason. But then the next thing we're going to do is check to see whether there's an AC surge protector. There's not one on here, so we'll make a note of that. We need to try to get this unit up and running, test it in heating mode so we can see what's going on with it. We're going to open up Measure Quick and we're going to do some basic setup on this unit. We'll tell Measure Quick how many tons it is, whether it has a TXV, and more or less what the SEER rating is. That way you got some preset information where those needles are supposed to go in Measure Quick. But still, this unit is not running and we're going to have to figure that out. So at this point, for me to test the performance of this heat pump, I need it to run. And it's not running. Contactor's not pulled in. So we get to the stage of our service call where we have to diagnose why it's not running. First thing I'm going to do is just hit this contactor and see what happens manually. All right, so we know that the compressor will run. It's just not being asked to run. So after testing to make sure we have 24 volts coming to the outdoor unit, we did. But we don't have a call on Y, which is our call for the compressor. So now we need to investigate why. All right, so when we get to the indoor unit, obviously the blower is running. Uh, and when we check 24 volts, we do have it on high. I expected to have that because that goes down to the thermostat. The thermostat was powered up. And then we start checking the yellow wires. Now it looks like they're breaking yellow through the float switch. There's no water in the pan. And as we're checking both sides of that float switch, there is no call on yellow, which leads us back to the thermostat. All right, so we're going to put this thermostat in test. We're going to turn on the heat pump heat, and we'll see if that makes a difference. Ah, well, look at there. A unit came on. So something is going on with that thermostat. I'm going to go ahead and let it run in test, and I'm going to check my heating operation, check my airflow, go through the rest of my diagnostics. Then I'll go back and try to figure out why the unit won't come on under its own power. Uh, and then we'll have a full list of recommendations for our customers. The next thing that I need to do is document the airflow. For that, I'm going to use the true flow grid by the Energy Conservatory. That has a Measure Quick integration. And so we're going to open up the app through Measure Quick and we're going to connect our devices. 
we got to tell the true flow grid that we're testing it in heating mode and so it knows what calculations to make. This is a heat pump and not a furnace, so we're going to tell it that. It's a horizontal air handler. We're going to notate where the filter goes. All that is what true flow grid needs to have. Then we're going to put the nominal capacity, which is three and a half tons. And then the true flow grid app just steps us right through the workflow of doing some static pressure mapping, but at the same time, we'll eventually put in the grid itself. The whole process just takes a few minutes. I mean, you're seeing it live as we go. It's not been edited. And it's simply just stepping through a few static pressure tests. And finally, it's going to get to the point where it wants us to insert the true flow grid. And that way, it can measure the static pressure with the grid in versus what it just took with the grid out. So here we go. We're going to go ahead and insert the true flow grid in. In this case, we're going to put it into the filter slot in the air handler. So we're going to follow the workflow as it continues through. I've got some airflow problems. I've got low static pressure as well, which is a little bit surprising, but the blower wheel may explain that because it was dirty. But then as it talks back to measure quick, I'm noticing something else. My pressures are not changing between low and high side. And so there's really not a lot to diagnose here. I don't have any compression ratio. Well, it looks like we got a compressor that is no longer pumping. And uh, just to verify that, I'm gonna do a quick pump down test, see whether it's able to pump down. To do that, we first have to put in cooling, which I'm gonna jump my O and my Y together to do that. And when I did, there was no whoosh, so that's telling me we don't really have much of a pressure difference between suction and high side. We already knew that when we looked at the gauge anyway, but that's just further confirmation. Now let's go ahead and pump down. Closing the liquid line down, that pump down test confirms it. We've got a compressor that simply is not pumping. It has failed. Okay, pump down test failed as expected, so my diagnosis for this equipment is that we have a failed compressor. We still need to figure out why the thermostat didn't call for uh, heating, and we'll do that next. Well, after going through the menu and reconfiguring this thermostat, uh, I was able to get it where it runs the heat pump now. So not sure what happened to whoever installed this thermostat. She said it was done recently by another contractor. Not sure what they messed up. All I did was just reset and reconfigure, and now it's running. So we did that one on the house. I believe we're going to be getting some uh, work out of her with the uh, extended list that I gave her. Going back to my full system assessment checklist, there are a lot of fields here that I could simply put NA because the compressor was not running. But typically I am doing at least a non-invasive performance check. And if I need a gauge up, I'll go ahead and do that. I'm recording superheat and subcooling and that sort of thing. There's also performance items for gas heat. Obviously there's no gas heat here. So I'm gonna grab a screenshot from the Atmo2 Pro IEQ sensor. It looks like their air quality was looking good. So we're gonna make a note of that. And then this is the part in the process where I summarize everything in my final notes. Everything that I found that was good and bad in the system, I'm going to summarize here. And then next, I'm going to give a list of recommendations. Now, the top recommendation I give is to fix everything. And if someone does all that work, then I offer a 90-day no-breakdown guarantee. Unfortunately, this unit is so old and in such poor condition that there are no repairs that allow me to give that recommendation. I'm going to have to replace the unit in order to give any kind of guarantee. But then from that point on, I start providing other options of recommendations. Some of the recommendations are left off as we go on down the list, and we get on down to just fixing what broke today. The other thing that I'm recommending is to replace the ductwork as an add-on option to replacing the system. That's so we can correct some of those long duct runs that are obviously going to be an airflow problem and balancing problem down the road. Finally, the app gives me a list of all the things that I red flagged, and I just like to scroll through that list and make sure that I did not miss anything either in my notes or my summary or in my recommendations. Because this process is so detailed and thorough, I'm going to find a lot of things going on with the system, and I want to make sure that I don't miss anything when I list everything in my report and in my recommendations. Finally, the report wraps up. I can save this. I can send this to the customer. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap up. We get all our tools and instrumentation probes put back up in the bag. We put in our test port plugs back in. And after having a conversation with the customer, she is ready to replace this unit. So this is now a sales call. So we're going to take some measurements. We're going to do a conduit tech heat load calculation on the house so that I quote her the right equipment. And uh, we'll resolve this thing once and for all. Put her a brand new unit in here and uh, she'll have years of comfort. She's gonna have an option to replace the ductwork or do it at another time uh, because the ductwork still is leaky, it still is inefficient, uh, and it wasn't really done right to begin with. We'll let her decide on what to do with that, but she has definitely approved the budget to replace the equipment. Okay, so we are all wrapped up here, about to pull out of the driveway, and I just wanted to recap the full system 
assessment diagnosis that I do really works out. It is time consuming. Yes, I could have jumped in there and found that bad compressor and the thermostat issue probably within 20 minutes. And I used to run those kinds of service calls. Um, but when you take the business approach of less is more, then I allot more time for each service call and I'm going to find more stuff. And the more stuff you find, ethically, the more revenue you're going to make. And also you're going to help that customer understand the importance of going towards the newer system if you find enough stuff wrong with the older system. Now, obviously, we don't want to do things unethically, and I don't think that I did in any way. You saw the things that I was documenting. But when we're that thorough, we start finding a lot more faults in HVAC systems than if we were just using the old approach and just looking at what specifically broke today. So I encourage you to try to implement that if you're able to in your line of work to be more thorough, spend more time with the equipment, gather more information, and get paid for it. Obviously, any service call is a loss leader. We're not going to be able to charge what we really should on a service call. But when it all washes out in the end, you will be making more revenue and you'll be doing it ethically. And it's a way to stand apart from your competition. So hopefully you got something out of this video. Thanks for tagging along. See you next time. Like, subscribe, follow, all that jazz. As always, work safe.